Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Perspective. On the show this morning, we have Sheikh Ismail Kamdar to talk to us about his journey into um, the learnings and the teachings of the Islamic world. Alhamdulillah. He's going to talk about the books he's written, 25 or more books on Islam that he has written. His time at the Open University, um, the International Open University, and he'll also talk to us about his research work at the Yakin Institute and a book that he has co-written with the renowned um, Omar Suleiman. So, so much to uncover on the show this morning, but we will uh, start off by talking about Women's Month. It is the 1st of August, and um, I think internationally, very especially here in South Africa, we celebrate women and we celebrate amazing women. And of course, the 9th of August is Women's Day. And Alhamdulillah, we are aware of the fact that uh, this beautiful religion of ours, Islam, does see women as equals and we celebrate women from an Islamic perspective as well. So let's hear what Sheikh has to say about women, their rights and their place and space in society. Sheikh Ismail Kamdar, Assalamu alaikum to you. Welcome to the program and what a pleasure to have you on the show this morning. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for having me on. And of course, I, in my intro, had uh, suggested that you touch a little bit on the issues around women in Islam, um, our freedom, our place, our equality, alhamdulillah, and just that uh, despite the Western world casting aspersions on Muslim women in hijab and niqab and perhaps suggesting that we are subservient, the reality is totally different, is it not? Islam really reveres women and women's rights as well. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to worship him. And he has given men and women different roles to play in the household. But this does not mean that one is superior to the other, right? It's the... The key difference to understanding Islam's approach to the Western approach is that Islam's approach to any topic is grounded in the idea that Allah created us, Allah knows what's best for us, and we need to live a life that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the uh, Islamic worldview, right? Everything is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you study Islam and when you study the history of Islam, it becomes very clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for everybody. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us laws to follow that are in our best interests. So sometimes these laws may seem oppressive to someone from the outside because they haven't lived within the Islamic worldview. They haven't lived within this understanding of, of living a life that's pleasing to God. But when you accept the Islamic worldview and the Islamic way of looking at things, then you realize that the few differences that are there for men and women in Islam, it's because Allah understands our natures and he wants what's best for us. So in Islam, men and women have equal access to paradise, equal access to God's revelation. Whatever good deeds we do, there's equal reward. Whatever sins we do, there's equal sin. But there are a few slight differences in the laws that we have to follow. And these slight differences are based on our nature. Our creator knows our biology. He created us. And based on that, he has given us slight differences to follow. And anyone who has lived an Islamic lifestyle knows there's absolutely nothing oppressive about it. If anything, it is freeing to live a life that is pleasing to God instead of always trying to please society. Um, beautifully expressed, alhamdulillah. I'm going to uh, tie that in with keys to a happy life from Quran and Sunnah, because that's what we are going to talk about. And of course, women have an equal and a very special place in Islamic society. But let me just, for the purposes of our audience this morning, uh, talk a little bit about you. And we talk about you being 
alhamdulillah, a graduate of a traditional alim program, and you also hold a BA in Islamic studies from the Open University, International Open University. But furthermore, we understand that you started uh, your Islamic um, education at the tender age of 13, and you began preaching at the age of 16. And also, you've written more than 25 books, but the first book that you penned was at the age of 23. Alhamdulillah, those are amazing achievements. You truly started embracing Islam at a very, very early age. What was the motivating factor for you? And I'm imagining you must have had, you must have amazing parents to have supported you through all of this. So, firstly, uh, Alhamdulillah, my mother is a very righteous woman who raised us upon the deen. Alhamdulillah. And my father was murdered when I was eight years old. So, I'm the eldest of four kids. I grew up without my father. And uh, I had to mature at a very young age because of the test of life. Right, Being the eldest male in the house at the age of eight, uh, it led to me having to grow up very quickly. But alhamdulillah, I have very strong support structure within the extended family. My father's father is still my father figure right till today. Alhamdulillah, he's still alive and we're still very close. And alhamdulillah, I grew up in a family where there was always this emphasis on loving Islam, practicing Islam, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at a young age, my mother encouraged me to seek Islamic studies full time. Uh, she wanted me to become a specialist in the area of Islamic studies. And so to honor her request at the age of 13, I started the Alimiya program and I graduated from it at the age of 20. And then I did my bachelor's degree in Islamic studies as well. And uh, yeah, it's definitely my mother's influence that played a strong uh role in in me going down this path uh but of course it has to come from the inside as well and and from a very young age i love to read i love history and once i actually started studying the laws of islam the uh the actual islamic uh, lord fiqh and sharia uh, i fell in love with the religion and i wanted to study it deeper and deeper and alhamdulillah right till today i continue uh, to study uh, Islam, I started at the age of 13. I'm in my late 30s now. I still continue to study every day. Uh, this has been a lifelong journey and uh, I'm grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything he has blessed me with. Subhanallah, and that leads me to the opening verse in the Holy Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, um, Ikra, read from the uh, uh, from the cradle to the grave. And that is and should be our purpose to not stop learning and, of course, to impart all of our learnings to the people around us so that we become a very strong family, a very strong community and a strong society at large. And I can't help but say this, uh, Sheikh, that uh, behind every successful man is a woman. And I'm going to go on about women because it is Women's Month. And you, you have just confirmed it. Your mother was the driving force behind all of your successes, alhamdulillah. Yes, alhamdulillah, that is true. And, uh, you know, we're living in an age where the importance of motherhood is kind of demoted. You know, a lot of... Uh, People feel like, you know, becoming a mother is not important or raising children is not important and it's just a success that's important. So I'd just like to remind everyone that in Islam, the mother actually has a higher status than the father uh, for the sole reason that she does play a bigger role in influencing her children. Right? Allah has given women this loving, nurturing nature that most men don't have. And so a loving heart of, of a mother uh, this goes a very long way in shaping the next generation. Motherhood in Islam is not just important, it's sacred. It is the, the backbone of society. That if, if, if homes have strong, loving, righteous mothers, then this has a ripple effect in how the society functions. So in Islam, we don't just honor our mothers, but we consider that to be the most important position in the, in the household, that of motherhood. Thus, we have that Islamic saying that uh, Jannah lies at the feet of your mother. Would you like to expand on that very quickly before we go to our first ad break? 
Yeah, so in Islam, because mothers make so much sacrifices for their children, uh, the children are expected to honor their mothers for life and to take care of them in their old age and to never do anything to hurt their feelings or to make them upset. And so in Islam, the, the, the bond between a child and a mother is lifelong. Alhamdulillah, I know of, of Muslim men in their 60s and 70s who still look after their mothers, who still have that close bond with their mothers, because this, this is what Islam teaches you, that if you want to get to paradise, one of the quickest routes to get there is to take care of your parents in old age, especially your mother. And so when this is the, the high status of a mother in Islam, that she is the pathway to Jannah, loving her, respecting her, obeying her, honoring her, taking care of her in old age, all of this is part of the ways to Jannah. And this is just part of the high status that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to women in our society. Alhamdulillah, and that once again um, underscores the importance and the equality and the high status that we as women and mothers hold in Islamic society. Let's go for our first break. We'll continue this fascinating discussion with Sheikh Ismail Kamdar. <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome back to the program. This is a Perspective with me, Julie Ali, and my guest is Sheikh Ismail Kamdar. We've just paid tribute to women. It is Women's Month, and very especially, we have accoladed mothers, mothers in society, in families, in communities, and how they keep families together. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all the mothers all around the world. Back to you, Ismail Kamdar, Sheikh Ismail Kamdar, and let's now talk about the first book you wrote. At the age, the tender age of 23, what was the book all about, and how did the community and family respond to your first book? Alhamdulillah. So the first book I wrote is called Having Fun the Halal Way, Entertainment in Islam. And the book was about what types of fun and entertainment are halal and how do you enjoy halal recreation. And the reason I wrote this is, uh, this is like 20 years ago almost, uh, there was this very staunch understanding of Islam that, you know, you're only supposed to be doing ibadat all day long and you know, people will kind of be shamed for having hobbies or having pastimes or trying to relax. And as I studied the tradition, I realized that this isn't what Islam teaches. So even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised the Sahaba that it's fine for them to relax with their families. It's fine for them to do things for fun. They don't have to be 24-7, you know, trying to only do good deeds. So this book was written as a response to the mindset that was common at the time uh, that Muslims shouldn't have fun and that life should just be about strictness all the time. Uh, and as for how it was received, it wasn't published in South Africa. It was actually published in Saudi Arabia uh, and distributed internationally. And internationally, it was received very well, alhamdulillah. Uh, right to today, people message me to say that they read the book and it made a difference in their life and it cleared up a lot of misconceptions that they had about this topic. Uh, locally, I don't think it really uh, was that popular locally. Um, this kind of uh, a thing with my books, they're more popular around the world than they are in South Africa. That's just Qadarullah. Allah's destiny. Uh, but that book specifically, because it was published in Saudi Arabia, uh, I don't think it really reached that much bookshops in South Africa. Uh, so I don't really know what the local reaction to it was like. What's your sense regarding uh, these different receptions to your book? You've just indicated that, um, and we know, it's on record that you've written more than 25 books on Islam and they very many different topics, and inshallah, we will unpack that a little later on in the show. But what is your sense of why Islamic books in general and your books haven't been well received in South Africa? Well, that gets a bit controversial. Uh, I think that 
generally in South Africa, we have a bit more of a sectarian mindset, right? People tend to be divided into little groups and they don't read outside of their group and they view anyone outside of their group as a deviant or as someone that they shouldn't take knowledge from. Uh, and one of the things that was very important to me in my journey of Islam is that I wanted to study broadly across many schools of thought. So even after completing the Alim program locally, I did the bachelor's degree in Islamic studies so I could study from a different perspective. It was essentially the same subjects, but with a different group of teachers with different opinions. And uh, this opened me up to the uh, idea that there are many different interpretations of Islam within mainstream Sunni Islam. And we need to be a bit more tolerant and open-minded about these differences of opinion. Uh, but because of that, some of the opinions that I now hold uh, which may be mainstream in other countries, they, they can be a bit controversial for our community. Uh, and that's why I don't think, uh, I, I think people who have more of a sectarian mindset, they are wary of anything written by someone who doesn't fit their box of what a perfect Muslim should be. Uh, yeah, sadly, that does seem to be prevalent, not um, only locally, but in other parts of the world as well. But um, Alhamdulillah, I'm more than sh certain that, you know, your need is important. You are doing, you've written these books and you go out and touch lives in a positive way because you are wanting to make a meaningful difference. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of your efforts, inshallah. And really very pleased to hear that your books are doing well internationally. Inshallah, there will come a time in South Africa where people will be clamoring to get your different books. And I'm, I have no doubt in my mind they are available in local bookstores. It's just a matter of people going out and purchasing them. Let's talk about your time uh, on, at the International Open University. I do understand that you served as a faculty manager. How did that come about and what was your role there? And in terms of Islam, did you manage to, uh, you know, do dawah through your role at the International Open University? So the International Open University is an Islamic university, right? So the, the students are Muslims and they're studying, uh, they're either studying Islam or they're studying other degrees from an Islam perspective. So it has uh, degrees in psychology and economics and variety of other subjects, but it's all taught from an Islamic perspective. Uh, I joined them initially as a volunteer, and I then did my degree with them. I got my bachelor's uh, with them, and then I became a, a, a tutor there, and from a tutor, I became the head tutor, and eventually I became the faculty manager. So altogether, I was with that university for a decade, uh, from 2010 all the way to 2020. Right, I was with them for uh, a long time, and Alhamdulillah, it was during that period that I think my works reached the most people around the world, uh, because uh, through the International Open University, I was teaching on average about a thousand people from all over the world through their online classes. And my role there was, on one hand, I was a university teacher teaching history and Islamic law. Uh, and uh, interpretations of the Quran, uh, but I also was the manager of the faculty, which means I had to ensure that we hired the right teachers and that everybody did their job. And uh, yeah, I served in that role for a decade. Uh, eventually, I got the offer from Yakin Institute, and that's when I decided it was time to try something new. Subhanallah. You also have introduced um, something called self-help self in the year 2014. Is it still running? And what is it all about? Yeah, so in 2014, I, I used to read a lot of self-help books at the time. And I had gained a reputation for my time management and self-confidence and productivity. A lot of people were asking me for advice in this area. They were asking me uh, to write something on this topic from an Islamic perspective. Uh, and so I started a blog, a website called islamicselfhelp.com. I launched it with two ebooks, uh, one on time management, one on self confidence. And now, a decade later, the, the blog is still going strong, Alhamdulillah. 
the ebooks have been downloaded thousands of times. Uh, the online courses there have on average 100 to 200 students. Uh, one course actually has almost 2,000 students at the moment. Uh, the, the, the purpose of the website is to help Muslims achieve their maximum potential while remaining grounded in the tradition. Meaning, I want Muslims to excel in whatever field they are in, to be the best in the world at what they do, while remaining strongly religious Muslims, right? There was this idea a few decades back that you have like Muslims who are experts in, in science and medicine and, and law and, and all the modern fields, but they would be secular. And then the religious Muslims would not be succeeding in, in this world. And that's not what our religion teaches. Our religion teaches we can succeed in both. We can be successful in, 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 this, in worldly sciences and worldly affairs while being religious and righteous and connected to our creator. And that's really what the books and the courses and the blogs at this at this website are all about. Uh, they are about connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having the right mindset, having the right beliefs, but also about pursuing excellence in everything we do, whether it's our families, whether it's our careers, whether it's serving our communities to be the best at what we do so that we can do this for the sake of Allah and we can make this world a better place. Inshallah. Uh, when we come back, we do need to go for our next ad break. I want to talk about, obviously, keys to a happy life from Quran and Sunnah. And then I also want your views on um, this whole trend, this rising a trend of Islamophobia all around the world. What is it that we as Muslims should be doing for Western people and other people to understand that Islam is a pure and a perfect religion and the, that non-Muslims shouldn't view Muslim people and Islam as a threat to them? So all of that and more coming up with Sheikh Ismail Kamdar right after the sad break. <laughs> Welcome back. My esteemed guest is Sheikh Ismail Kamdar. He has authored over 25 books. He also runs a self-help website and a blog. And he co-authored a book with none other than world-renowned Omar Suleiman. So we will talk about that in a little while, but let's talk about the all-important matter, and that is the rise of Islamophobia all around the world and what we as responsible Muslims should be doing to try and change that perception um, amongst non-Muslim audiences. Welcome back, Sheikh. Your thoughts on Islamophobia? Alhamdulillah. So I have a slightly different perspective on Islamophobia, right? Uh, and this is the perspective uh, that uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad speaks about in his book, Traveling Home. And that perspective is that to some extent, it's natural and it's going to happen. And what I mean by this is that when you read the stories of the Quran and the stories of the prophets, there were always people in every era who hated Islam, who feared Islam, who saw Islam as a threat to their lifestyle and their worldview. This kind of person exists in every time and place. It's just in our times, we've given it a label, uh, Islamophobia. So to some extent, I understand the existence of Islamophobia because Islam does threaten the worldview of many people. Uh, people who want, who want us to live a godless lifestyle will be threatened by the idea of people who still believe in God and fear God and try to please God. It threatens their lifestyle. People who want to promote immodesty and immorality are threatened by people who still cling to the modesty and morality of, of divine revelation. So there is a, a clash here that's inevitable, right? But it doesn't have to be everybody. Uh, there needs to be from our end a way, uh, a, a way of reaching out to people and explaining to them why Islam solves many of the problems of humanity today. You see, people have been sold a, 
a false picture. Over the past hundred years, they have been pushed this idea of of progress, of liberalism, of of modernism. Uh, this idea that the world's a better place today than it was in the past. This idea that we are more evolved, we are more civilized than the people of the past. And I believe that this is a false narrative. I believe that the world was a better place uh, during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu and, and the Sahaba. Uh, the world was a better place under the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it was a better place under the Abbasid Empire. Uh, it's just that people are ignorant of what life was like at that time, and they assume that it's better today. We've actually done a lot of damage to the world in the past hundred years, morally, uh, even in terms of uh, pollution, even in terms of destroying the environment, uh, in terms of wars, in terms of creating weapons of mass destruction. Modernity has created a lot of problems. So a lot of people are blinded from this. They assume that modernity is all good and religion is, is the enemy. Uh, I think what we need to do is we need to switch our marketing up. We have to start showing people that listen, what we've been, what humans have been doing for the past hundred years has created a lot of problems. Islam, which is the natural way of life in tune with both human nature and divine revelation, solves these problems. Whatever these problems may be, whether it's moral problems, whether it's the family problems, whether it's dealing with, with, with the natural environment, in all of these areas, Islam solves the problems of humanity. So we need to start selling Islam as a solution to the problems that the world has today. And in this way, inshallah, we'll win more people over. However, I don't believe it's possible to win everybody over because it is, it is Allah's qadr, it is the destiny of, of this world that there will always be forces working against Islam. And this has been there in every era from the beginning of time. And there's no doubt that we face very many challenges as a Muslim society in this day and age. And everything you've touched on is absolutely spot on. Um, there's so much of evil and misdirection in the world that our youth are very, very uh, easily succumb to all of those um, evils of modern society. But be that as it may, this leads me into my next question. It's a very, um, I think, natural lead up to talk about keys to a happy life through Quran and Sunnah. What can you tell us about how we can achieve this, inshallah? So this is my latest book, 25 Keys to a Happy Life. We actually have the book launch this week. Uh, and... I wrote it about a year ago in Ramadan, so that's last year's Ramadan. Uh, I was at a point in my life where I was a bit sad and depressed about many of the trials of life. And I wrote I wrote this to myself. A lot of my best books were, are notes that I wrote to myself uh, to increase my own spirituality or to reconnect me with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to cheer myself up. And this book essentially, the, the premise of the book is that the modern world is built around the pursuit of happiness, right? This is what the modern world is all about, the pursuit of happiness. Why are people chasing money? Why are people chasing fame? Why are people committing zina? Why are people chasing alternative lifestyles? It's all the pursuit of happiness. But I argue that this modern lifestyle has created more unhappiness. We have more depressed people in the world today than at any other point in history. We have more suicidal people in the world today than at any other point in history. We have more lonely people in the world today than at any other point in history. So I argue that the parts that people have chosen to seek happiness are the wrong parts. And the right way to seek happiness is to go back to what is natural, what made humans happy for the bulk of human history. And I summarize it in the book into 25 points. Initially, it was going to be 50, but I felt that would be a bit overwhelming. So I summarize it into 25 points, but those 25 points can be further summarized into five points, right? Five things that we need to be happy. Number one is a connection with our creator, that we have a life that revolves around worshiping the creator, loving the creator, trying to please the creator. This is the key to happiness. This is the ultimate key to happiness. The Quran says it is only in the remembrance of God that hearts find true happiness, true inner peace, right? So number one is the creator. 
Number two is family. Family is crucial. And we are living in the age of hyper-individualism where people don't want to get married. They don't want to have children. Life's just become about me, me, me. It's all about myself. It's all about my wants, my desires. And people then wonder, why am I lonely? Because God didn't create you to be alone. He created you to be a mother or a father, to be a husband or a wife, to have family. Family is crucial to happiness. It's very important that we strive to have families and, and to have loving families because that's really where a lot of our happiness comes from. The Quran mentions family as a source of sakina, a source of inner peace, a source of happiness. The third thing I mentioned is community. And again, it goes back to individualism because people are so self-obsessed. We are losing our sense of community. People's lives have just become about themselves. They don't want to volunteer anymore. They don't want to uh, serve the community. They don't want to help their neighbors. Everyone has come to themselves. It's become all about what do I get out of it? This is the mindset people have today. And I say we need to let go of that mindset. We should be serving our community, helping our community, being part of our community for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of uplifting others. And in that, you will find true and genuine happiness. And it's interesting that even modern psych psychiatrists uh, in diagnosing depression, one of the uh, solutions that they propose is to do community service, right? Because they, they said that serving people makes you happy. But I think it's selfish to do it just to make yourself happy. You should be serving people because you love your community and you want to be a part of it. Uh, the fourth thing that, that I mentioned that makes up a bulk of this book is your character, your akhlaq. Uh, just being a good person. If you want to be happy, be a good person. Be honest, be truthful, be brave, be selfless, be caring, be loving. Be a good person. And you will attract goodness into your life. You will uh, have better relationships. You will have a better standing in your community. You will be happier if you are a good person. To if you are betraying people, if you are lying to people, if you are mistreating people, then that will come back to haunt, haunt you. That will come back to hurt you. And the fourth and final thing that makes up a large portion of this book is the importance of living a purposeful life. That we don't just live for ourselves. We don't just uh, live for entertainment. We don't just, you know, we have this modern lifestyle of you go to school, you go to university, you work, you retire, you die. It's not a purposeful life. Uh, it's a very shallow life. I invite people to live a more purposeful life, a life that is pleasing to God, but a life that leaves an impact on others, a life that, that will continue to be a source of reward for you after you pass away because you've brought so much goodness to this world. And so really this is what the book is, is teaching people, that we are searching for happiness in the wrong place. Happiness doesn't come from pursuing our desires, pursuing fame, pursuing wealth. Happiness comes from godliness. It comes from family. It comes from community. It comes from good character. And it comes from living a purpose for life. And I expand upon this in these 25 chapters in this book. Subhanallah, and you've hit the nail on the head because yes, we have reached that point in our lives where we all are so private and want to guard our individuality. We don't want to intermingle with family and relatives. Just go to a wedding these days. They're small, they're very contained, um, but of course they want to keep up with the Joneses, so they have an absolutely high-class wedding and invite only people in their own inner circle who probably have the, a similar lifestyle to them. Um, and it's also about, I think, greed, power, uh, instant gratification. And here comes in the famous African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. We've lost yes. that. And in, and in that, um, losing that very important element in our everyday lives, we're losing a lot of our youth as well. We're losing our connections and we're losing our identity. But we've got to go for our next um, ad break. When we come back, we'll expand a little more on that with our guest, Sheikh Ismail Kamdar. Mm -hmm. 
My guest is Sheikh um, Ismail Kamdar. He's authored over 25 books, and one of his books has been co-authored uh, with Sheikh Umar Suleiman. But before we get to that, and which of all of the books that he's written is closest to his heart, let's um, get him to comment on um, my statement just before the ad break. Welcome back, Sheikh. The comment or summarize it for me? Uh, the instant age, how we are driven by greed, by power, mm -hmm. by importance, um, and being someone in society, by running and chasing after money, and forgetting the finer and the little things in life that does make a difference, and the fact that we've lost the concept of the village raising a child. Yes. It's not your business. Keep out of my business. You have no right to judge me or my family. I will raise my family as I see fit. And that's where we've lost the concept of it takes a village to raise a child. I completely agree with you on this. This is something I actually speak about quite often. You know, a lot of uh, young ladies today, they complain that motherhood is difficult. And I say that we've made motherhood difficult because in the past, it's not just the mother that's raising the child. It's the grandparents, the aunts, all the siblings, the neighbors. Everybody's involved. That's how motherhood was for the bulk of history. But today, because we've become so isolated, because we've become uh, so cut off and we cut people off, we begin to feel overwhelmed. And if you just let people in, if we, if we just start working together again, if we just form uh, the, uh, the village again, it takes a lot of pressure off the mother because she doesn't have to do everything, right? There's a lot of people involved in raising people and shaping people's personalities. You know, I look at how I was raised. You know, I always mention that even though my father uh, was taken uh, at a very young age, I grew up with many father figures. I grew up with my grandfathers, I grew up with my uncles, and I grew up with many mother figures. Besides my mother, they were my aunts as well. And they all played a role in raising us. And I tried to ensure that my children have the same that they have access to their grandmothers, they have access to their uncles and aunts, uh, that we work together uh, in raising the next generation. The sad reality of the modern world is in what you mentioned, instant gratification and individualism. I believe individualism is at the root of most modern problems. Historically, people saw themselves as part of a collective. They saw themselves as part of the ummah, as part of their community, as part of their village, as part of their tribe. And this is where their personality and their responsibilities and their matureness came from. In modern society, people see themselves only as individuals. My dreams, my goals, my life, my rights, whatever I want. And as a result, they lose their connection to the family. They lose their connection to the society. They lose their connection to the ummah. So we really need to fight against this mindset of individualism. We need to go back to uh, being villages, to being communities, to being extended families. That is where happiness lies. That is where success lies. And really, if you want to raise children well, you have to get everybody involved. That is the natural way. And as you speak, a thought that just crossed my mind is that individualism to me, now equals selfishness and self-centeredness. Yes. That's what we become as a community. That's true. And, and the way I differentiate it is that about 30 years ago, we had individualism. Now we have hyper-individualism. Mm -hmm. So hyper-individualism is like, an, it's, it's, a, it's individualism taken to an extreme. So 30 years ago, it may have been like, oh, I want to pursue my own career path. I don't want to have the same career as my father. Right? Okay, that's, that's not that bad. That, that's, that's understandable. Now it's become like people tell their own parents, you have no right to have any role in how I raise my children. Well, they the grandparents. They do have a right. They do have a say. They are involved. You can't cut them out like that. But hyper-individualism has fragmented families to this level where people don't want anyone involved in their life at all. And it's just become all about the self. As you said, it becomes selfishness. And arrogance. Let's not forget about that. Yes. Um, it drives us to become greedy, arrogant, and very, very selfish. Um, Allah guide and protect us. And we now come Amen. to uh, a part that I'm really interested in hearing uh, what you have to say.
getting the Baraka and the Quran 30 for 30 series, which you co-authored with Sheikh Umar Suleiman. How did you connect up with uh, Umar Suleiman? And I know that that uh, relationship is still going very, very strong because you are involved with the Yakin Institute. Talk to us about this collaboration with Sheikh Umar Suleiman. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so one of my skills is networking. Alhamdulillah, I'm able to establish a strong network of uh, ulama and uh, important people all over the world. Uh, and honestly, the way I do it is I just walk up to people and, and introduce myself. So it was about eight years ago, I was speaking at a conference in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, and Umar Suleiman was speaking at a different conference in, in Kuala Lumpur. So after my, my lecture, I went over to the conference where he was speaking, and I walked up to him and I introduced myself, right? And that was it. I just walked up to him and introduced myself, and we stayed in contact since then. And a few years later, in 2020, uh, I was looking for some change. I was looking to do something different with the next phase of my life. So I messaged him and I actually DM'd him on Twitter. Uh, it's very strange because he doesn't ever reply to DMs on Twitter, but it was God Allah he did that day. I DM'd him on Twitter asking him if he has any work for me. And he gave me a call on WhatsApp and we spoke for about an hour and I explained to him what I'm good at, what of what the uh, what benefit I can bring to Yakin Institute and uh, why I think we'd be a good fit to work together. And a month later, he made me an offer. And Alhamdulillah, I have been with Yakin Institute since then, since 2020. I head the books department. Uh, as the head of the books department, I have overseen the production of about 10 or 12 books, uh, four or five of which I am the co-author. Uh, Four of them co-authored with Sheikh Omar Suleiman himself, alhamdulillah. And uh, the way those books came about is that Sheikh Omar Suleiman has the Quran 30 for 30 video series every Ramadan. And I had the idea of summarizing those video series into books. And so, every, so we ended up every year with a new book, just like we had every year a new uh, video series. And humbly now, now five years in, we have four books in that series. Uh, most of them are published as ebooks, but the latest one uh, is coming out soon as a paperback as well, inshallah. Perhaps by next Ramadan, it will be available in, in the market. So um, after or whilst you're still in this collaboration with the Yakin Institute, I kind of was thinking to myself, where to from here for you, Sheikh uh, Kamdar? I mean, you've truly reached... To me, it seems like the ceiling in your career. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And I should imagine there are still quite a number of books in the pipeline as well. Alhamdulillah. So it's important for us to remember that in Islam, success is not achieved in any worldly measure, right? Success is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and entering into Jannah. And really, uh, fame and money and worldly success can be a test. It can be a distraction from, uh, from the real goal. So it's important that we remain focused on what matters. I try to live my life in a way that I'm continuously, continuously producing sources of continuous reward. Meaning that if I pass away, these books, these online courses, these lectures, they will continue to be a source of benefit for me in the afterlife. And so one of my goals in life is to write a hundred books before I die. Inshallah. So I'm only caught away there. So inshallah, I think I have plenty to do inshallah over however long Allah SWT chooses to keep me on this earth. We all need to remember that at the end of the day, we will leave this world one day. And when we leave this world, we will have to account to Allah for how we spent our time. And so I try to spend my time benefiting the ummah through the skills that Allah has given me. One of those skills being writing. A lot of people say that writing books is difficult. Alhamdulillah, it comes easy to me. And so I've really dedicated my life to writing books that are beneficial to the ummah and teaching online courses that are beneficial to the ummah, hoping that inshallah, uh, this will benefit me in the afterlife. That's really what matters, that in the afterlife, these serve as a source of reward and entrance into Jannah. That's, that's a real success. Until then, we, we've been tested. And even fame is a test. And even money is a test. And we should never lose sight of that. 
And believe it or not, that's where we're going to have to leave it. It's been wonderful talking with you this morning. What I do need to also ask is, I think I heard that there's some sort of a conference coming on and you are going to be uh, giving a, a talk or two at this conference in South Africa. Can you tell us a little bit about that, but very quickly, because we have come to the end of the show. Yes, yeah, so the Muslima Today conference will take place in two weeks' time in Durban, South Africa. You can visit the Ilm SA uh, website or Instagram page for more details. They have a variety of speakers, and the purpose of the conference is to give Muslim women uh, guidance on how to live a uh, an Islamic and productive lifestyle in the modern world. Uh, and I will be speaking at the conference about my book, 25 Keys to a Happy Life. So I will be expanding upon these concepts and how to live a happy life, inshallah, at the conference. So it's for women only, and uh, it uh, will be, inshallah, in Durban in two weeks' time. Uh, I highly recommend that the ladies in Durban attend the conference as they are some excellent speakers and very important and relevant topics to our time. Sheikh Ismail Kamdar, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of your efforts. Keep us mm -hmm. in your du'as. Until the next time, as always, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And that's where we leave it on this episode of Perspective. I do hope you'll join me again next week at the same time for Perspective. <music>